Uh, good nerve, Shabbos, everybody. First, the Birchas Kohanim, Vayedaber, the Neil Moshe Lamar, Daber, Laram, Babon of Lamar, Kaisavorochos, Bene, Yisro, Lamar, Lahem, Yvareche, Hadi, Noi, Vishmerecho, Yoira, the Noi Pono, Velecho, Vichuneko, Yisa, the Noi Pono, Velecho, Vyosem, Lecho, Sholem, the Somer Shemi, Al Bene, Yisro, Elva, and the Avorachem. If any of you have uh, missed and not been able to see live our Chabad Gala, please, after some time after the sermon or after Shabbos, visit ChabadGala.com and you'll watch two hours of a most festive, entertaining, inspiring evening. It really all came together. And if you really want to be entertained for two hours, please visit ChabadGala.com, watch and enjoy, and then spread it to your friends as well. Also, big news, next Shabbos is the grand reopening of our shul. We're going to be moving back indoors without no more social distancing and no more masks. We're moving back. We're going back home. We're putting COVID behind us, and we're moving forward. During the COVID period of time, we uh, were able to remodel the entire shul. It's beautiful inside. So you're all invited to join us as we reopen our shul next Shabbos at 10 o'clock. Services will begin 10 o'clock. This Shabbos is a special Shabbos on the Chabad calendar. It's the Shabbos right before the 3rd of Tammuz. Shabbos night and Sunday is the Rebbe's 27th yard site. So I'd like to take some time today to talk a little bit about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. But I'll back up and I'll first go and we'll talk about the previous Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson. And in 1929, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, the previous Rebbe, at the time he was living in, in Riga in Latvia, he was exiled from Russia by the Bolsheviks. He took a 10-month trip to the United States. He had an audience in the White House with the President of the United States at the time. And he visited many of the cities of the Jewish communities in the United States during that 10-month visit. Some 55 years after that visit, there was an article that appeared in a newspaper in New York called the Jewish Press talking about that historic 1929 visit. And in response to that story, someone wrote a letter to the editor telling his own personal story, which I found fascinating because it encapsulated everything that the previous Rebbe represented and clearly the mission statement of what the Lubavitcher Rebbe was all about. So this is what he writes as to the letter to the editor about that 1929 visit. He said, I had the privilege of meeting the previous Rebbe during that famous trip. To this day, even in my old age, he wrote, I think about the disrespect with which my friends and I initially spoke about this great man until this day I cringe. The six of us were in our late teens. We were living in Philadelphia at the time. It was before the Depression and World War II when we were enjoying life. We had all but abandoned our Judaism. Occasionally we would attend a reform service so we would join a Jewish youth group. We considered ourselves, we were progressive, we were the enlightened people, we even considered ourselves superior Jews. And one day we see in the newspapers that this man named Rabbi Schneerson, known as the Lubavitcher Rebbe, had come to town and he would be receiving visitors at a home on 33rd Street in Philadelphia. As we read this story, my friends and I talked amongst ourselves and we said, who does this rabbi think he is coming here to our country, coming from Europe, to advise us on our Jewish life? Where does he come off telling American Jews what to do and what's what? So by our next Jewish youth meeting, we brought this up with our group leader, that we really found who does he think he is? So the youth leader said, if it bothers you so much, why don't you go to that scheduled time that he's going to be here in Philadelphia, you have the address, ask him yourselves. It's a good question. Who do you think you are? What are you doing here? So we were chutzpah and we said, you know what? That's a good idea. We're going to go. <laughs> so that Sunday, we got together. We went to the address on 33rd Street. 
we climb the stairs of the front porch and we see through the window that the house was packed with people. We rang the doorbell and this dignified bearded man came to the door and he asked us what we wanted. And we said, we're here to see the Lubavitcher Rebbe. We have a question for him. The man had a pad of paper and he said, okay, let me write down your question. I will submit it in and I'll get you a time when the Rebbe will see you. As you can see, there's a lot of people here waiting. What's our question? We would like to know if he really expects contemporary guys like us to keep an old fashioned religion in a modern country such as this. That's our question. So the man says, okay, I will uh, submit your question to the Rebbe and I will come back and tell you about what time would you like to come inside and wait? And they say, no, we'll wait here on the porch. Okay. A minute later, this Gabai comes back and he says, the Rebbe would like to see the six of you now. We were, we were surprised because there was a house full of people way before us and they look quite more religious than we did. They seem to fit the part more. And we were ushered into the house, past this waiting crowd, everyone staring at us as we must be some important people that we're getting right into the front of the line. We climb up, the, walk up the stairs, and at the top of the stairs stood the Rebbe himself. He was tall, he was handsome, he had these bright eyes, he had this warm smile. And his hand was outstretched to greet each and every single one of us as we made our way up the stairs. He showed us to the room that we would be having our appointment and he began to put out folding chairs for the six of us. And we offered to help and he said, no, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then he said this to us, I want you to know that this is the happiest, most important moment for me since arriving in Philadelphia. You're probably wondering why I've bumped you ahead from all the people downstairs and why I asked you to come up right away. He said, you see, the people downstairs, they're here to ask for my help, for my blessings. One of their daughters is not well, so I'll pray together with him for her recovery. But that's up to God. That's in God's hands. I can just pray. Another person probably has a lawsuit and wants me to pray that he will prevail. But again, there's another side to the lawsuit. So all I can do is pray for justice and let God handle it. There's a man that probably wants some business advice. I'm not a businessman, but I'll give the best advice I can. But your request, your question, that's the question I came to America to answer. That's the question. I want to address. So when I saw your question written on this piece of paper, I said, ah, finally someone's asking the right question. Bring them in. So first of all, the Rebbe says, I want you to know this. There are 613 commandments in the Torah. And while I, as the Lubavitcher Rebbe, I try my best I find it not always possible to keep all of them all of the time. There are many mitzvot in the Torah that you can only perform if you live in Israel. I don't live in Israel. There are many mitzvot in the Torah that you can only perform during the Holy Temple times. We don't have the Holy Temple right now, so I can't do them. There are mitzvot only for men. There are mitzvot only for women. There are mitzvot for a king. There are mitzvot for a Kohen. I'm not a Kohen. So what do I do? I can't perform the 613 commandments, although I want to. What do I do? I do the best I can. I do the best I can. I do as many as I can. And with each one that I do, I get closer and closer to God. As, as the Rebbe was talking to us, understand, we came in with this hostility. We came in with this chutzpah of who does he think he is. And just the warmth and the smile and the embrace and the welcoming, and the non-judgmentalism, and this love, and this concern that he seemed to have for his fellow Jew, it was coming through. And that venom and that cynicism that we had within us was just melting away. 
And he continued by asking us to try to do the same. Try to pick, pick something in the Torah. Study the Torah and keep as many mitzvahs as you can. Do the best you can. And if you do the best you can, you're doing exactly what the Lubavitcher Rebbe is doing. We're both doing exactly the same thing. The best we can. He asked us for our Hebrew names and the names of our mothers so that he can pray for us and for our families. And then he said, it would be a great honor for me, the Rebbe said, if you would allow me to put on tefillin with each of you. And we each stood up and we put on tefillin with the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself. And each of us, before leaving that room, we promised, we promised him that we're going to live up to his suggestion of doing the best we can. We walked out, the appointment was over. We stopped on that front porch and we looked at each other and we said, what just happened to us? What just happened? That was spiritual, that was real. We felt something, did you feel it? I felt it, it was real. That was holiness. We knew we experienced something. We knew that we knew so little, but yet, we knew so much. And between us, we all undertook, you know what? Let's do it. Let's take upon ourselves today something that we haven't done before. One of us said that they're going to pray every single day. Another one said that they're going to try to get a pure film and put on film every day. Another one said, I'm going to stop working on Shabbat. We each decided to take upon ourselves something in honor of that moment. He said, let me fast forward for you. None of our lives were the same since. All six of us went on to become observant Jews. All six of us have raised nice Jewish families with children and with grandchildren following in the ways of Torah. So that was 1929, and the Rebbe understood that if you want to change the world, you're going to have to somehow get to the American Jew, and you're going to have to get to the American youth, and you're not going to get to the American youth with force. You're going to get to the American youth with love and with warmth. Eleven years after that visit to the United States, 1940, the previous Rebbe came to the shores of this country to live the final ten years of his life. And when he first arrived, he stayed not in Brooklyn. When he first came, he stayed in Manhattan. He stayed at a hotel in Manhattan until 770 Eastern Parkway was purchased. It was called the Greystone Hotel. And between the torture and the persecution that he suffered at the hands of the Russians and what the Nazis Yemakshimon put him and his family through, physically he was a broken man. He was confined to a wheelchair. But spiritually he was a powerful force, a powerful force of energy and determination. And from the moment of his arrival, he began organizing the yeshivas to open and synagogues to open and mikvahs to open. And he started building this infrastructure for Torah Judaism in the United States. And, and these leaders that came to see him from American Jewish establishment, from the federations, all the leaders at the time would come to see him. You know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe escaped Europe and he's here living in America. They all felt they needed to come and they said, Rebbe, this is America, it's not Europe. You're here, you're safe. And you have your small group of some two dozen followers with you. Find a nice home, get some good doctors and you'll write your memoirs and you'll relax, you'll retire. But this idea of, of building an infrastructure for Judaism in America, the old Judaism, the Judaism of Europe, it's not going to work here in America. Rebbe, we need here to explain to you that America is very different. And American Jewelry won't go for this. So let's stop the attention on opening schools and shuls. It's not, it's not for here. And the Rebbe put everyone on notice. America is not going to be any different. We're going to bring the torch of Yiddishkeit here. In fact, it's going to blaze here. It's going to brighten here more than ever before. And the Rebbe was, the previous Rebbe was determined. The Bolsheviks 
They tried, they couldn't stamp out Judaism. The Nazis, the communists, they all tried. Judaism is going to survive, and we're going to carry the torch forward. And he defied conventional wisdom. And those early schools were open. My father, in a blessed memory, who escaped Hitler Yamakshima's clutches by seeking first refuge in Japan, and then later for a few years in Shanghai, China, eventually found freedom in this country. And he was an eyewitness to these events in the 1940s, in the late 40s. And he, he told me he saw this, this strength and the resolve of the previous Rebbe. And even back then, they knew something awesome was about to take root. They knew there were a small group of followers. It was a small group of Hasidim. If you saw the size of the room in which all of the Hasidim fit in, it's smaller than our sanctuary here in, in the Agora Chabad. Smaller than that. That was all of Chabad in one small room. That's the amount of survivors that made it. And a few American Jewry Chabadniks. But that determination and that resolve was something where they, they believed it. That for all the pain and all the sorrow that they endured, the phoenix would rise from the ashes. How? They didn't know. When? They didn't know. Where it will all unfold? They didn't know. But what a generation that was. What an incredible trailblazing generation they were. A bunch of orphans, a bunch of survivors without their parents, without their brothers, without their sisters, without their uncles, without their aunts, without their buddies and zabies, surrounded their Rebbe and said, let's do it. Let's do it. And they became teachers and educators and emissaries. They had one desire. We're going to bring the world closer to Mashiach. You see, they experienced suffering. They experienced pain. They knew what anti-Semitism was more than any other generation before. Enough pain, enough suffering. We were promised Mashiach, and if we can do something about bringing it, let's bring it. Let's end the pain, let's end the suffering. So now let's go to 1950. The previous Rebbe's son-in-law, the Rebbe of our generation, assumes the leadership of Chabad following his father-in-law's passing. Suddenly this, this torch begins to shine with greater radiance and intensity. Suddenly you start seeing the plan unfold. And he begins this idea of sending emissaries, not just to establish Jewish communities. That people knew that always happened. Even in Europe, people would go to establish Jewish communities. But we're talking about something unprecedented in world history. Sending people to non-established Jewish communities, where Jews may have lived, but Jews that had no interest in Judaism. And the Rebbe is charging them with this responsibility of make it come alive. You see, not support a present Jewish community, a practicing Jewish community. No, build a Jewish community. And he was sending rookies. <laughs> he was sending shmegegis. He, he was sending people that had no, no leadership skills, but he's saying, you can do it. Just be truthful. Just teach. Just be honest. Just be warm. Take the teachings of Hasidus and make it come alive. I'm best reminded of all of, of, of what the, the Rebbe accomplished by a biblical verse. And I've, I've said this many a times, I'm sure you all have heard it, but it's the Shabbos before Gimel Thomas, we can hear it again. And the most famous of all the biblical stories is the story of Joseph. And the story begins by telling us the brothers didn't like Joseph, right? He knows they don't like him, and he has these dreams, and they're bowing to him in these dreams, and that sure doesn't help matters. And then Jacob gives him a coat of many colors, and it sure makes it worse for him. Now the jealousy is there, the rage is there. And then the Torah tells us one day the brothers are off taking care of their sheep in Shechem, and Jacob is concerned because they're late, they haven't come home, it's been too late, they're late, and he calls Joseph and he says, Lech no, please go. See how your brothers are doing. Now, Joseph knows this is not going to be a comfortable mission for him. The brothers don't like him, but he doesn't hesitate. 
and he goes because he's sent on a mission from Jacob. And if you're sent on a mission from Jacob, you don't procrastinate. You just go. Joseph arrives in Shechem, and he doesn't find his brothers. And he meets a stranger in the street. And the stranger says to him, Ma mevakesh, what are you doing here? You look lost. You don't look like you belong. You don't look like you're from here. What brings you to our city? What do you seek here? Ma mevakesh. And Joseph answers this line. I'll say it first in the biblical Hebrew and then translate it. Es achai anoichi mevakesh. I seek my brothers. I'm here looking for my brothers because I have to bring them back to their father. Think about that exchange. The Lubavitcher Rebbe says to his children, to his Joseph, to his Hasidim, go find your brothers. They're lost. They've been separated from their father, from God Almighty, for a little too long. They may not be comfortable with you at first. They may not exactly roll out the welcome mat for you upon your arrival. But go find them to bring them back to their father in heaven. You see, when the Lubavitcher Rebbe took over the leadership of the Jewish world, things were at their bleakest. We had just come through a holocaust that decimated our people. Six million. Six million souls. One and a half million of them children. And those who survived, yes, they survived physically, but they had their faith challenged and questioned, unlike any other time in our history. It was hard to believe post-Holocaust. It was hard to preach about God post-Holocaust. So American Jewry was, was struggling spiritually. And to top it off, American Jewry finds themselves at that exact time where they're struggling spiritually with their faith, suddenly accepted into circles never before imagined. And so assimilation becomes rampant as well, because now they're accepted into all these other circles. And then intermarriage begins biting at the heels, because suddenly American Jewry are willing to marry a Jew. That didn't help matters for us as well. There was a famous Harvard study that came out and released at the time that predicted that based on demographic trends, the American Jewish community would likely be less than one million by the time the United States celebrates its tricentennial in 2076. It's just going to go down. It's going to assimilate and intermarry out of existence. And they were able to predict when it would be American Jewish life would basically come to an end. Maybe they said you'll have some pockets of ultra-Orthodox Hasidim, but for the rest of Jewry, as they wrote, you can say the mourner's Kaddish. It's over. So many innocent Jews slept away from their roots, from their heritage, from their Torah, not by the tyranny of oppression, that was Europe, but by the magnetic draw of assimilation in the land of the free. Because all this newfound freedom led this to this desire to be free from it all. So they dropped religious life and they stopped practicing the ways of their parents. And they said goodbye to kosher and to Shabbos and to shul. And new movements popped up offering watered down versions, diet Judaism, Judaism light, no calories, no fat. And in place of mitzvot and traditions, we had clubs and we had memberships and we had tea parties. And this, this innocent generation of Jewish children grew up in the United States, denied of their Jewish heritage, denied of the memories that their parents had of Yiddishkeit when they were growing up, denied the memories of a Babi and a Zaydi and their homes filled with a rich sense of Jewish life, denied the memories of Kiddush and Challah and the Shabbos table and Kosher and Mezuzah and Tefillin and Yeshiva. You see, it's an interesting phenomenon when you get flowers from the florist, right? They're beautiful, beautiful bouquet of flowers, but they don't last very long. A few days after you get them, they start wilting away. They don't last. That very same flower, if it was attached to its roots, if it was still growing in some field somewhere, would last a lot longer. But even flowers that are attached to their roots still have to be in a climate, in an environment that's more natural for that particular flower, for that particular plant. So these cut flowers that we get, they don't last long. They're not connected to their roots. 
and they're not in their right environment. But if you take the same seeds and you plant them in the right place, in the right environment, and they stay connected to their source, and they stay connected to the ground, they'll continue to grow and spread and they'll flourish. See, Judaism in America looked like it was going down the path of the cut flower. It had no roots. It was cut off from its past. It had no traditions to hold dear and sacred. And then cults were going after us. And Maharishis and missionaries were preying on Jewish souls. Historians and statisticians will tell you that in order for any ethnic group to survive, you need a minimal birth rate of 2.1 per family. The American Jewish family was at 1.4. And so it didn't look promising. Enter the scene, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Along comes an individual trained by his father-in-law as to what the goal should be. And he would change the Jewish world. Go out, he said, look for your brothers and sisters. Go to every corner of the world and find them and bring them home. Teach them the beauty of Yiddishkeit. Teach them the warmth of a mitzvah. Teach them the sanctity of a Shabbat, the richness of our heritage. At first, the Jew on the street said, Ma mevakesh, what are you doing here? You don't look like you belong. You look funny. You got this beard, you got this black hat, you got this black coat. You don't look like you're from here. What are you doing here? You knock on doors with palm branches and lemons asking us to make a blessing. What are you doing here? You stand on street corners asking people to put on tefillin or light Shabbos candles. Ma mevakesh. And that answer of Joseph from the book of Genesis rings so true as achai anoichi mevakesh. We're looking for our brothers and sisters because we want to journey with them on this path to our Father in heaven, back to our heritage, back to our roots. That's what the Rebbe taught us, Chassidim. This is not a generation that we can only look inward. This is not a generation that we can only look to build established Jewish communities. No, this is not the time to build up protective walls around your shtetl. This is not the time to close your eyes to the spiritual needs and your thirst of millions of your brothers and sisters. Maybe other generations, not this generation. As Achai Anaychi Mevakesh, we seek our brothers and our sisters. The Lubavitcher Rebbe was a revolutionary figure. He would not accept the status quo. The Jewish world needed love. The Jewish world needed inspiration. The Jewish world needed a welcoming embrace. The Jewish world needed each and every one of us to take our candle and bring light to some other Jew. I'd like to conclude with two short stories. One I shared last Shabbat during services. And the other is a simple personal story dealing with myself. First, the story that I shared last week. There's a, a rabbi, his name, was, his name was Rabbi Moshe Hecht. He was the founder and director of the first Jewish day school in New Haven, Connecticut. He was an emissary of the Lubavitcher Rebbe to build Jewish education in New Haven. In 1974, Rabbi Hecht was having a very difficult time in New Haven difficult getting the school going, difficult keeping up with the budget. And he was very, very frustrated, very down on himself for the lack of success in his activity. He felt he wasn't doing a good job and he was an honest man. So he writes a letter to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he says, I know what was wanted from me in New Haven. I have clearly failed. I'm not up to the task. But it would be important if the Lubavitcher Rebbe would select someone with the skill needed for New Haven to build up the school. So please pick someone else and send someone else. A letter of resignation and at the same time asking that the Rebbe think about the person that he's going to select to send there because it needs someone that has certain skills. I want you to listen to the words of the Lubavitcher Rebbe in his response to Rabbi Hech, because it's a response that each and every single one of us could hear coming from the Rebbe to us in our own lives. The Rebbe said, I preempted you 
and responded even before you made your request. I already did precisely as you advised, and I sent Rabbi Moshe Hach to New Haven, Connecticut. It appears from your letter that you are unfamiliar with him, and you don't know this person or the abilities and the powers that he has been granted. It would be most advisable that you acquaint yourself with him and immediately everything will change. Your disposition, your trust in God, your everyday joy. Wow. The Rebbe believed in Rabbi Hech's abilities far more than Rabbi Hech believed in his abilities. Rabbi Hech stayed and built up that school and stayed there to the last day of his life. And that school continues through Rabbi Hech's son till this very day. That's the Rebbe's challenge to each and every single one of us. Get to know your own skills, get to know your own abilities and use it to bring this mission to its completion and bring Mashiach now. And each of us can do our part. Each of us can reach out to someone else. Each of us can help grow, can help flourish a Jewish community. Sacrifice some of yourself and be part of the team. Be part of the Rebbe's team. A short personal story. I haven't uh, shared this in public. Um, at least I don't remember ever doing so. But I was uh, quite young when I was sent out to this neighborhood. I was 20 years old at the time. I was asked to come out temporarily. There was a, an opening that needed a temporary fill. Rabbi Gordon, of blessed memory, called me. I was in rabbinical college in Montreal. And uh, I was asked if I would leave yeshiva and come out here temporarily. It's been temporary now since uh, 1983. So I remember writing a letter to the Rebbe, asking the Rebbe's advice, what I should do. It was a long letter. I told the Rebbe that I was learning well in yeshiva. I told the Rebbe that I enjoyed being in yeshiva in Montreal, but at the same time I felt I knew this community. I had opened the camp in this community two years earlier. I knew the kids and the kids were in Hebrew school. There was no one teaching them. And then I was torn both ways. I was torn what to do. I wrote on the envelope the word urgent. In Hebrew, the word was muga. I wrote urgent. For me, it was urgent, right? I obviously, years later, you realize urgent. There are things far more urgent than I needed to know what to do. But for me, it was urgent. So I wrote the word urgent on the envelope. I got an answer from the Rebbe Thursday evening. Thursday evening, I got the answer. And I won't get into the details, but the Rebbe did send me here. The Rebbe wanted me to continue learning in yeshiva part of the day in Los Angeles, drive out every afternoon, drive back in the evening, learn in the evening in the yeshiva. It was a deal the Rebbe made with me, but that will be for another time. So I get this answer Thursday night. There's a farewell party in yeshiva for me. There's a bus that leaves Montreal for New York on the evenings at midnight gets to New York Friday morning. My plan was to spend Shabbos in Crown Heights by my family, by my parents, and by 770 Eastern Parkway. I had a Sunday morning flight to Los Angeles to begin what became, call it a career, call it a mission, whatever you want to call it. I remember it was Capital Airlines. Anyone remembers in the 80s, it was an airline called Capital Airlines. I still remember Sunday morning flight Capital Airlines. I'm in 770 Eastern Parkway, that Shabbos. The Rebbe's secretary sees me, and he says this to me. Maishi, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean, what are you doing? We spoke Thursday night, remember? You, you called me in Yeshiva, Montreal, and you said, you have an answer from the Rebbe for me. I, how could you have forgotten you? This conversation just happened. And you told me that the Rebbe said that I should go to take, take the offer and go out to California. And that's why I'm here. He says, no, no, that's not my question. I know, I know the answer you got. What are you doing here? I was confused. What do you mean, what are you doing here? He said, you wrote the word urgent on your envelope. 
which meant, as far as you was concerned, this was an urgent request that needed the Rebbe's attention immediately. And the Rebbe gave you that attention immediately, and he responded to your questions, detailed response to your questions. If it's urgent, Maishi, what are you doing here? Why aren't you in California already? You should have taken a taxi to the airport and taken a flight from Montreal to Los Angeles. It's urgent. You don't have 48 hours to spare. It's urgent. What a message to get before I even began. If you work for the Rebbe, every minute is urgent. Every person you meet is urgent. Every day has urgency to it. No time to waste. So, as we enter into this period of the 27th yard site of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, let's recommit ourselves to his mission statement, and let's finish the job. Let's bring Moshiach together. We can do it. Each and every single one of us, our mitzvah, all the other people, other Jews, the millions of Jews out there, let's do it. Let's finish the job and bring Moshiach now. Have a wonderful Shabbos, everyone. Look forward to seeing you very soon.